Sr. Uh, John Jory went to David Jones Sr. in 1979, um, appealing to him for uh, funds to, to really do a new play festival right. Um, and that's how the partnership between the Humana Foundation uh, and Actors Theatre began, and that's, that's why we're here. This is the Humana Festival of New American Plays. Uh, that partnership is, is the longest uh, current and continuous partnership between a theater um, and a corporation in the country, and it has produced um, an, ex an extraordinary number of new plays. Uh, just to give you a couple of, of facts here, uh, this partnership has produced more than 400 new plays, representing the work of uh, more than 200 playwrights. Um, three plays premiering at the festival um, earned the Pulitzer Prize for Drama. Uh, one was The Gin Game that Zan uh, spoke of. The other was Crimes of the Heart uh, by Beth Henley, um, which was starring Kathy Bates. Um, interesting little fact there. And the, uh, the third one was Dinner with Friends by uh, Donald, Donald Margulies. That was in the year 2000. Uh, so those three plays won the Pulitzer Prize for Drama. Um, eight other plays have been adapted for film and television, and they have, and other plays have just won numerous amount of awards. Um, so that's that's the Humana Festival for you. Um, Adam, can I yeah, just, go ahead. Just, just to give you a, a little bit of more information, uh, the gentleman that he's referring to, David Jones, is the founder with another man named Wendell Cherry of <coughs> the Humana Corporation. They were entrepreneurs of the highest level. They had the vision to say that they could create a healthcare system for profit as opposed to not for profit. And they were very, very adventuresome. So when John came to them with this idea, they loved the entrepreneurship of it. They loved the bold, daring venture of it. They loved that it was innovative. And those were all reasons that they were really swept into this in a, in a highly committed fashion. And also, at that, by that time, uh, the Humana Festival had, uh, had Gin Game in the first season. It had Getting Out by Marsha Norman uh, the second season. And the third season was Crimes of the Heart. So at that point, I think there was this um, <coughs> share, the, the synergy or uh, respect from the founders of Humana and John seeing that they were both very visionaries who had this idea of how to change this community. And so I think that's how that, in some ways, that partnership made a lot of sense because they were both on these really successful tracks. Sure, and kind of along those same lines, um, how exactly is the Humana Festival, you know, there are other new play festivals in the country, can this panel speak a little bit about why the Humana Festival is different and why John Jory's vision for this festival is, you know, sets it apart from other new play festivals? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, these two can probably speak to it better, but I think just to remember at that time when Playfair started, nobody in the country was doing this. This was a new idea. It, it seems probably foreign to many of you who are so accustomed to seeing new work uh, around you all the time, but it really didn't wasn't happening anywhere else. So I think that was the foundation of what really caught people's attention too. I, I would agree with that. I also think that um, it caught, it, tell me the question again. Oh, just uh, how the man was set apart from oh, other new places. It's set apart for, for three very specific reasons. One is that we do fully produced work. Each of the plays is fully realized in and of itself. So almost nowhere else in the country are they doing this many plays in full production. Uh, a couple of them do two full plays and then they do readings and workshops. So that's probably the principal thing. The other thing I think that sets our festival apart is the level of hands-on person uh, uh, hospitality. Uh, you have all enjoyed it this weekend as you have been here. Uh, Trish K. Jones is really the person behind that. It was her uh, very clear understanding that if you were going to get people to come, to Louisville, Kentucky, which is hard enough to get to, that you had to give them such a good time that they would come back next year and tell their friends about it. And so for, even to this day, uh, over our big industry weekends, people are met at the airport. They are given very personalized attention. We have so much hands-on uh, approach to people. We get to know them, we talk to them, we make sure that we follow up with them. And people feel it's, it's their festival. They have a real sense of personal ownership of it. And then kind of also the, the quality of the work, the plays that have been selected over the years, um, it's, it's just got a reputation 
internationally that you will get at least one, if not more, superlative theatrical experiences in a weekend. Uh, I do think that this particular year, I, I think is a, 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 an example of sort of a banner year. I think we have so many of the plays selected this year have really just taken off, and I think it's, it's a great year, but every year there's at least one play that we know is going to just lead the charge, and I think that's another reason why the festival continues to be so successful. And I would also say, I think Actors Theater has a long history of making sure that the playwright is centered to the work here. Um, I don't know that that was always true before uh, the festival, in, in terms of other cities and how playwrights were treated, and so I think um, we know that even recent surveys say that Actors Theater is the place that many writers want their new work produced because of the care attending that we provide and really the control and um, listening to that. So as the Humana Festival was, was going on and kind of Actors Theater was building this, this national reputation, uh, we'll transition now to the international rep uh, reputation that Actors Theater has, and that is in a big part to the international tours that went on uh, beginning in 1980 and continuing, I believe, until 1992, uh, somewhere in the mid-1990s. Um, so maybe Paul can speak a little bit about this, because you designed the shows for all the international tours, correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so can you tell us, and did you actually travel with the company um, when they were traveling? How, how did that work as far as designing sets and things like that? No, I didn't, uh, I didn't travel because my responsibilities here were uh, always pretty heavy. And um, the, the only one that I did go on was uh, the first one, which was getting out, uh, and it was traveling to, um, uh, uh, Belgrade. Belgrade and Dublin, Ireland and uh, Israel and uh, I was a, a little terrified because I'd not, I was trying to do design for something that I didn't know or see uh, and uh, the State Department uh, representative who had, who had tapped us and had arranged for us to do this trip, uh, I convinced her that I needed to to go myself and actually look at the spaces if I were going to try to find some way to solve getting out, which was a major um, uh, issue because there was a prison involved and jail and bars and uh, uh, it's a, it was a fairly large uh, over, uh, difficulty in scenically. Could get away with some suggestion, but there had to be at least enough. And uh, so I, uh, I went to Belgrade first, and it was a very, I had never been in an Eastern European city before, and it was quite an interesting um, experience. And uh, the theater was uh, uh, very small, uh, not, not much larger than the Victor Jory, if you've seen that theater here in this building. Uh, and uh, so that gave me a clue that I went to Ireland and uh, it was a huge proscenium stage, uh, some 25 feet tall and some 40 feet wide. And, uh, so obviously there had to be some kind of arrangement made between those two cities. And the weather then turned sour and I was uh, on my way to Israel, and so I was late getting into Israel. I was supposed to be there for three days. Uh, I actually got in, was whisked to see the theater, and I was back at the airport getting ready to leave and come back, at which point they sort of arrested me. <laughs> uh, I, was, uh, I, I couldn't explain why I was in Israel for less than 24 hours. I had not gone to Jerusalem. I had not done any of the things that I was supposed to do. So as a result, I was uh, detained. <laughs> and uh, finally, we had to get in touch with the State Department, uh, the lady who had arranged the tour, and uh, she was able to get me on the but that was quite an interesting experience. And for no other reason, I, I didn't want to travel any more. <laughs> I'd let the youngsters do that for me. 
Well, uh, Zan was actually involved with the international tours also, correct? You, yeah. you actually, well, Zan traveled um, in 88, I believe, is that when you? Jeff and I were on, Jeff and I oh, were on the both? same tour to okay. Warsaw, and um, this is actually a true story, it's very funny. Uh, <laughs> I knew that the theater had gone, I've done a lot of traveling, and I was, when I came here, I was really keen on the opportunity to do some traveling, but particularly to Australia. And I had said to John Jury, if you ever get to Australia, please, make sure I get to go on that tour. So um, I was in my office one day, and John came in, and he said to me, hey, uh, how do you feel about snakes? <laughs> OK. He said, like, are you afraid of them? And I said, I'm, no, I mean, it depends. I'm not afraid of them in theory. I don't know that I'd want to you know, wrestle with a, a rattlesnake. Why are you asking? And he said, well, I need somebody to take a snake to Poland. <laughs> do that. So one of the shows we were touring was called Snake Handler, uh, a play that is uh, part, I think it's part of, uh, 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 talking, with. talking With, and um, it's, you know, the, the woman holds this snake, and so I was introduced to Judy. She was a 10-foot black king snake, and uh, among my many challenges was that in Poland I also had to get her fed, which required four mice a week, and the Poles had a very hard time understanding why I would be looking for mice to feed my snake. Um, so, you know, I became very attached while we were there. Uh, the actress who was doing this role was a brilliant actress, but she would walk off stage, and she was really in a heightened state of emotional level at, that, at the end of the play, and she would walk off stage and just drop Judy, and I'd be there, like, catch Judy. So I really cared a lot about this snake. But coming home, we, our plane was very delayed coming out of uh, Poland, and we got into JFK, and we had a very short window of opportunity to get through customs and onto our um, returning flight to Louisville. And um, I missed my family and wanted to get home. And uh, so I said, everybody ahead of me, I said, everybody else go through first, so that if I get delayed, you guys can go ahead and go, and I'll just get there. And I had the snake in the box, and uh, we got to, through customs, and the guy said to me, what's in the box? And I said, this is my snake, Judy. She's a, 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 actually a guest of the State Department. She's been visiting in Poland for a while, and she's coming home now. And he said, well, I'm going to have to get somebody from agriculture over here. And I said, you know what? Actually, you can have her. I'm going to leave. You can take her, because I'm going to make my plane. And even if you just have to do whatever you want to do with Judy. And he was like, take her, take her. <laughs> It's real fast. It's <laughs> great bluff. That's great bluff. That's very interesting. Uh, I did get to go to Australia too. You did, you did go to Australia as well. That must have been very interesting. What was the reception like? I mean, how did other countries receive actors theater and you know performing these 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 plays? I think we did over fourteen hundred productions or something like that overseas. So um, part of the United States Information Agency had a, an exhibit called American Theater Today. And so you would go, um, and there would be these long, long lines. When we were in Poland, I don't know, we must have done 140 performances. And people would line up, they would queue up early in the morning to get in, and you would make your way through the exhibit. And then the culmination of the event was to see a performance. And we toured many of these short plays that Actors Theater is, is, is famous for doing, things like Handler and other pieces. And so all of it was done was simultaneous translation so that people could hear it in their native language. And um, people would then want to hang out afterwards and meet with us. and. Um, it was very well received, and people were, I mean, it was, it was a big deal when Actors Theatre would come to town with these, and we toured all over Eastern Europe. It was part of, I think, the philosophy of the State Department to bring American theater in, so it was be, sort of behind the Iron Curtain, if you will, at the time, and exposure to something American that was not necessarily as political, even though some of the common... Well, even I think some of the plays we were we were not encouraged to tour because they were too political. Um, but it was um, it was a great experience for us and the actors, and I think people really enjoyed seeing us. And uh, it continued until uh, 1992, three I think, when basically the State Department changed their focus and basically didn't have the money to to do the tours. One of the great advantages for us was that we also met some phenomenal artists on these tours, and um, two directors in particular. One is um, Laszlo Martin, who was the head of the theater in um, Bud uh, Hungary, uh, and he did. Uh, he has done a lot of work with us. And then there was also a 
fabulous director by the name of Miladen Kislav, who was the head of the theater in Bulgaria. Uh, and uh, uh, Miladen eventually did uh, migrate to the United States and taught at Carnegie Mellon for many, many, many years. And uh, then he returned to uh, Bulgaria after the country was opened up a bit. Um, so we, we were also able to, to form really positive artistic relationships with people, and that was very useful for us as well. And, and another one of those talents was Miklos Fair, who um, was the resident designer for uh, Laszlo's theater. And uh, so and he, he spoke only Hungarian. And he was only about this tall. <laughs> and uh, he came over when Lazo came to direct his first production for us. Then he brought uh, Miklos as the designer. And um, it, it was a, a, a Midsummer Night's Dream. And it was a, a, extraordinary to be introduced to the thinking process of uh, a major designer like Miklos, and the interesting thing was that this, the stage was all black, and it was a series of pillows, and the pillows was about the only English word that, that uh, Miklos could speak, and uh, on one side of it there were various shades of green, and on the reverse side of the black, and so by changing the the pillows, uh, faces, we changed locations. And I designed lights for it. And uh, the other thing that it had a mechanical lift uh, that in the back, a bridge that went up uh, with the, the court at the end of the play. And there was a star pattern uh, dropping in behind them. So it was quite an extraordinary event. I loved it. Then two years or three years later, they came back as a team and did uh, School for Wives. And, uh, that, and, that, and I designed the lights for that one as well. And uh, then they came, um, they were to come back again, but Miklos passed away uh, in the meantime. So anyway, he was a major talent. And speaking of other uh, major talents uh, that we collaborated with in our history, we'll talk a little bit about about some of the major names that we've worked with in the past. Um, obviously, Ann Bogart and the City Company have been, have been very influential collaborators with us. They've done multiple productions, both in the Humana Festival and, and the Main Stage series. Um, Marcia Norman, who was our actually first resident playwright, um, this is where she premiered Getting Out, which was a huge hit, um, as well as other shows. She also wrote Night Mother, which did not premiere here, but it did win a Pulitzer Prize in 84. Four, I believe. I think so. Um, Marsha is from the Lowell community, right. and, and John knew her socially, and she was at that time making her living as a social worker, and was very interested in playwriting, and John said to her, well, write a play about something that you know. And uh, she based getting out on a, a situation of a person that she was working with in, um, in her life as a social worker. And uh, other notable playwrights that we've both premiered works and have uh, produced other shows of theirs, um, John Peelmeyer, who wrote Agnes of God, that premiered here at the Human Festival in 1980. That was a, a very, very powerful production. Um, Tony Kushner, who wrote Angels in America, uh, he premiered a show called Slavs. That was the short title. The long title is Slavs, Thinking About Longstanding Problems of Virtue and Happiness. It's a very long title. Um, as well as other works. Um, Another interesting playwright who we have premiered nearly every one of her productions, uh, but no one has actually ever met her. No one's ever had an interview with her. Uh, no one even knows what she looks like. And uh, that is Jane Martin. Jane Martin is an anonymous Kentucky playwright. Um, we think no one knows. It's a two decades uh, long mystery. Uh, but we've produced ne nearly every one of Jane Martin's plays, uh, and they've been uh, huge successes. Um, Keeling Dew is one of Jane Martin's productions that was a Pulitzer Prize nominee uh, in the mid-1990s. Uh, and, and her, his, its shows um, have, been, have been widely popular. Um, 
So let's talk really, really quickly before we open up the, uh, the floor to questions. I believe we're getting low on time. Uh, I just wanted to kind of run through a list really quick of famous alumni that you all might know from Actors Theater that we're very, very proud of. Uh, Ned Beatty, who's a Kentucky native, was in shows in the early, uh, the early years of Actors Theater. Um, Victor Drury, who played Jonas Wilkerson in uh, Gone with the Wind. He was the overseer. He was here for many years, and he's actually the father of Joan Drury. Um, Jeffrey Tambor, who you all might know from the Larry Sanders show, as well as my favorite, Arrested Development. He's George Sr. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ken Jenkins, who you all might know from, well, he's most popular for uh, playing Dr. Kelso on Scrubs. He was here for many, many years in the early history. He's also kind of credited with like pounding theater, which isn't true, but he was here for many, many years. <laughs> people just kind of associated him very strongly with the pounding of the theater. Uh, Michael Gross, who you all may know from Family Ties, maybe not the younger ones. And the audience family ties, he's the father. Obviously, Kathy Bates, you know, what more do you need to say about Kathy Bates? She was here for many, many years. Um, incredible, incredible actress. She actually won um, an Academy Award, or no, a Tony Award for Night Mother in New York, which was written by Marsha Norman. Uh, Joe Morton is a star of Broadway, film, and television. He was here in the early years. Kevin Bacon was also here. Yeah, Kevin Bacon. That's what's up. Uh, <laughs> Timothy Busfield. I'm sorry? Six degrees. Six degrees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Six, yeah, exactly. Um, Timothy Busfield, who uh, you all might know from a show called 30 something, uh, he's also in the West Wing. He was the, uh, one of the reporters, Danny Con Cannon, I believe is his name. Um, Margaret Martindale from Justified, she was here. She was actually performing in, uh, well, multiple productions, but also in The Talking With, so she went on those tours. Um, she's fabulous. Uh, Christopher Cooper, who is an award-winning actor of film and, and television. Uh, Holly Hunter was also at Actors Theater in the 80s. Um, John Turturro, who's one of my favorite actors, he's in a lot of the Coen Brothers films, uh, as well as a lot of the Adam Sandler movies. He's hysterical. Um, Julianne Moore was also at Actors Theater. She was in a production called Bone the Fish. Uh, Calista Blockhart from Ellie McBeal. She was here as well. <laughs> Uh, Nicole Scherzinger, who is actually a, she's a, she's not a Louisville native, but she went to DuPont Manual High School here in Louisville, and she performed here in the early years. She's, she was in the Pussycat Dolls, just for reference. Um, Jennifer Carpenter, who you all might know from Dexter, she uh, plays in Dexter. She's actually from Louisville. She's a Louisville native. Uh, she was in productions here when she was young. Uh, Delroy Lindo, who is. Um, who is a very popular actor of film and television, uh, was here in, in 85 and also came back in, in the late 90s. Uh, Karen Grassley as well, who was Caroline Ingalls on Little House on the Prairie. Yes, yeah. Uh, Billy Porter, who um, recently won a Tony Award for Best Actor in Kinky Boots. I think it was last year. Yeah, he was here for Angels in America when it was performed in the 90s um, here at Actors Theater. Uh, Michael Shannon, who is actually a Lexington native. You all might know him from Revolutionary Road, Boardwalk Empire, um, or General Zod. He's like the main villain in the new Man of Steel movies. You all have seen that. Uh, he was here in the early 2000s. Uh, Ian Brennan, who you all might know as the co-producer, founder of Glee. He was also here. Yeah. And uh, Kirk Hansen, who's been touring with uh, Wicked. He was in Girlfriend last year, actually, uh, in a production last year in the spring. Um, so those are some famous alumni from Actors Theater. We have a rich history. Um, so I guess we should now open up the floor for questions. in the late 70s or early 80s uh, when I attended the Humana Festival and I believe I witnessed a play called The Shaper. Yes, okay, that's what I thought. Um, <laughs> 1986. 86, okay. Um, I, I just wondered because it was like uh, the very, it's a, there's a scene and there's a man standing there and he's sanding his surfboard and he's entirely naked. <laughs> so this was my first experience with nudity. I just point out, you know, how adventuresome, you know, actress theater is, and 
left a lasting impression on me. <laughs> achieve, and I think that that is quite an accomplishment. I'm excited about the fact that it is about 50% people of color. Uh, I would like to see more people of color writing, and I would like to see more roles for people of color, but I would like to see more diversity. So, yeah. How does one go about designing for a festival where so many plays have to have such quick turnarounds in just in just a couple of spaces? <laughs> you just jump in. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question. Um, I, I'll tell you the the. I learned a great, uh, let me just say this, I learned a great lesson on the second Humana. That was the getting out period. Uh, there were two shows in, in this room, getting out and Still do when I'm dealing with repertory 
is I see it all as one big problem, one big puzzle. And then you begin to see what the element of this play, as opposed to that play, what they have in common, what you can make them have in common without damaging but supporting them. And uh, as a result, that was the way I then practiced the process. Uh, and but, uh, uh, that would still be the way I would have to solve it. It's because I try to design the, the play as the playwright intended it to be, not as I would, would want it to be necessarily. I'm not a signature designer, in other words. I don't have any givens that I'm trying to prove. And so that was, that was I laid myself wide open and used that uh, every possible chance to put it together that way. Thanks. So, um, of course, um, theater is an art that's always for a very specific place and time. But as you all mentioned, um, the great thing about actors' theater is that it's a it, it, it's a theater of and for Louisville, but also of and for um, the world. So, I was wondering if, if that's ever a difficult line to straddle, um, being a theater for a specific community, but also having the whole world watching. Is, is that something you have to think about? Other people may <clears throat> have a different opinion. I, I don't actually think so. I think that our goal is that every audience is our audience. And they may come from anywhere in the world, but we are in Louisville and we have a responsibility to our community because we care about our community, but we care about all of our communities. So I think we really just try to do plays that are important for people to see. Now, Les Waters has launched, it is launching an initiative uh, that's important to him where he would like to be doing something during every season that specifically celebrates Lowell. And he kind of started that with our town this year. Um, he's going to revisit a play that we did several years ago about a community in Louisville called Butchertown. It's called At the Vanishing Point. And he's going to bring that into uh, what's gone on in Butchertown in the years since that play. But all of the work that we do, um, and especially in the festival, is about all of our audiences. Thank you. For all of our. <laughs> What's the youngest playwright you guys have ever worked with? Do you know? Max is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> we have, <laughs> we have uh, an extraordinary um, education component here with our education department called the New Voices, and we, um, it's kind of a humana festival for high school writers, and um, high school writers from all across our region, um, because we teach writing in the high schools, are invited to submit 10-minute plays, and they go through a rigorous selection process, just like our other plays do. And um, we usually select, I think it's like eight, maybe nine plays, written by students from all over. And they have an intense experience coming in and going through various stages of how to work with a dramaturg, how to work with a director, what does it mean to cast your play. And then these plays are produced um, at the end of April. Um, and the apprentice company uh, are the performers in them. It's a pretty remarkable experience. Max was one of them. He's done it a couple of years, and there are others. Oh, and so, yes. And so I would say our youngest playwrights are that we produce on our stages have been in high school. Do you ever search out diversity? Do you go to Native American reservations, to inner city? to find the plays that you're looking for to produce? Um, I don't think that I could say that we have actually gone to that extent. Um, early in the years, when we were getting the festival started, we had, John had made the statement that we would read all the plays that were submitted to us, and then that got to be like several thousand. <laughs> um, and so we, on our website, we have a fairly specific process by which plays can be submitted to the festival. 
We use the 10 minute plays as an opportunity to meet people who have not yet potentially been connected into the mainstream of agents and representation. And we discover many, many playwrights, Jordan Harrison being one of them. The, the first work we did of Jordan's was a little 10 minute play and uh, Lucas Knopf was a little 10 minute play. And so we take those 10 minute plays pretty seriously as a way to meet new people. We have not, in my experience or the, into my memory, actually gone out into a specific community to find a particular play. I don't know if we would do that, but we have not yet done that. Uh, thank you all very much for, for those questions. We have run out of time. I did want to make a quick little plug here. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about the history of Actors Theatre, uh, we are publishing a, a 50th anniversary commemorative book uh, in September of this year, and I'd like to give a shout out to the book team who's working on that. Uh, Christopher Castle, Kate Chandler, and Kirsty Gockel, as well as KET is uh, producing a documentary about our 50th anniversary season that will also be coming out in September, so check that out as well. Uh, so thank you all very, very much for coming today.